9. Go back to Matthew chapter 9. And I'll be preaching through um, to verse number 17. Okay, and then the second half next week. But Matthew chapter 9 verse 12. Look what it says there. Uh, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. The title of the sermon tonight is, They that are sick. They that are sick. All right, so let's pick it up there in verse number one. It says, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. So this man is a man who could not walk, a man that was disabled. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. One thing that you'll notice in this chapter as we go, we go through it, but even next week, is Jesus does many healings. He heals multiple times. And every time he points to their faith, and he says there, look, he, what does it say in verse number two? It says, seeing their faith said unto the sick of the palsy. So it's not just the man that is sick, but also his friends that brought him to Jesus, the people that were with him. Jesus saw their faith. They had their faith on Jesus. They had their faith that Jesus would be able to heal them. And he heals them. He says, son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, it's something very interesting because here you would expect that Jesus would just heal the man. You think he would just raise him and allow him to walk. But now he says, look, just be happy. Be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. And I think sometimes we need to be reminded as believers, you know, we go through life, we go through the hardships, we go through the trials, you know, family, friends, you know, finances, difficulties, whatever it is in your life that you might come across, we need to remind ourselves to be people of good cheer, people that are, are happy, the people that are rejoicing. Why? Why should we be happy? Because thy sins be forgiven thee. Hey, with God, you know, our sins have been forgiven. We've placed our faith on Jesus Christ. We too have had our sins forgiven. We too are righteous before God and we can rejoice in that. It doesn't matter how bad this world can get. It doesn't matter how many people can betray us and our, our best friends, you know, backstab us or whatever. Hey, we can always rejoice in the salvation that God has given us. Say, so, Jesus, why aren't you healing this man? This man can't walk. You know, well, he's making a point, obviously, right? But I want you to also notice that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. Okay, he had the power to forgive sins. This is him demonstrating who he is. Okay, he's not just the son of man. He's not just, well, he is the son of God, obviously. But he is God manifest in the flesh because it is only God who can forgive sins. Let's look at verse number three. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves. So they're not speaking out loud. They're saying this within themselves. They're just, they're, they're just thinking about this, right? They're just thinking about it. What are they saying? This man blasphemeth. You know, they're, they're too afraid to speak up. They're too afraid to say that verbally. You know, this man blasphemeth because there's a great fame for Jesus. Everyone loves him. All right, so they won't speak up. But they, in their hearts are saying this man blasphemeth. Now, just very quickly, keep your finger there and turn to Mark chapter 2. Turn to Mark chapter 2 because I want you to understand why they're saying he blasphemes. Okay, and I think within the context we can make sense of that here, but just uh, Mark chapter 2 makes it a little bit clearer. Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Look at this. Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Who can forgive sins but God only? Hey, these scribes are saying the truth. The only one that can forgive sins is God only. So do they, are they considering Jesus Christ as God? Of course not. That's why they're saying he speaks blasphemies. All right. Hey, but those that, that are listening, those that believe in him, what are they identifying when he says that thy sins are forgiven? They're saying, hey, this is true. This is, this is God in the flesh. This is the son of God. This is the son of David. This is the Messiah. This is the promised one that was to come. Now, I'll get you guys to turn to Titus chapter 3. Turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and I'm going to read to you from the book of Isaiah, okay? You guys go to Titus 3. Isaiah, now I'm turning, I'm turning to Isaiah 43, verse 3 says this. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Hey, who is the Savior of Israel in the Old Testament? It's the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel. Hey, you know that, that title, the Holy One, is also given to Jesus Christ, all right. Now I'm just going to read to you from verse 11. It says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. There is no Savior beside God. So if Jesus is able to forgive sins, what's he saying? He's saying, I am God. 
I'm God Almighty. Hey, these references in Isaiah is pointing us to Christ, that God will be manifest in the flesh. You guys are in Titus 3. Look at verse number 4. Titus 3 verse 4. And, and look how the New Testament puts this for us. It says, But after that, the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared. Hey, who's our Saviour in verse number 4? It's God, right? God our Saviour. Verse number 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. Who saved us? God. God saved us by His mercy. Okay? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Because we know when we believe on Christ, internally we are renewed. We're given that new man. The new spirit has been revived in us. The renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It's a powerful passage there. You know, verse number six, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse number four, God, our Savior. All right, so we can see, you know, it, this is a fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. You know, that Jesus Christ is God. He's our Savior. He has the power to forgive sins. You know, and look, no one, no, there's no other religion. There's no other religion of their, of their founders, what they call the founders, that claims they can forgive sins. There's no one else. Or maybe the cults. All right, but you know, Muhammad cannot forgive sins. You know, Buddha, he can't forgive sins. Hey, but the, but the God of Christianity, Jesus Christ, who we name ourselves after as Christians, as Christ followers, He has the power to forgive sins. Even better than that, He's God. He's God, the, the only Savior that we have. Go back to Matthew chapter 9, please. Matthew chapter 9. So we see Jesus Christ forgiving the sins of this man of the palsy. And look at verse number 4. I love verse number 4 because it confirms for us, it confirms to the scribes, that he's God, all right? Because remember, these scribes, they're just thinking about it in their hearts, all right? And they still reject him, because look at this. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Jesus says, I know your hearts. Why do you think evil in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your thoughts? I mean, if I was one of these scribes, and Jesus is saying the things that I'm thinking about, I'd be like, this is God, right? And the reason for that, I'll just read to you very quickly. Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know the hearts of men? And then in verse 10, it says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. Hey, so who can know the heart of man? Who can know the thought life? God says, I, tr I know the hearts. You know, I try the reins. You know, and so again, just by Jesus doing that to the scribes, and these scribes know the, they know the scriptures. That's why they know only God can forgive sins. And yet, now Jesus knows my heart. You know, this is, they should have woken up to themselves and say, this is God. You know, we can see, you know, it just seems like there are, there, are, there are certain people in this world, no matter what you show them in the scriptures, no matter how much you prove to them the Bible is true, they're still going to reject it. All right, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9 verse 5. Matthew chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus says, For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. So it's easier to, for me to forgive their sins to say that, or to make him to walk. Of course, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Okay, because we can forgive each other's sins, right? If you do, you do a wrong to me, you know, I, I call you out, you apologize, I can forgive you for the sins you've committed against me. That's easy. But can I make you rise and walk if you can't walk? That's hard, right? That, that, that's even harder. Verse number 6. But that ye may know that the Son of Man have power on earth to forgive sins. Then, um, then saith he to the sink of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. So Jesus does the greater difficulty. He does the greater work. And, and heals this man in his physical uh, flesh to prove that he had the power also to forgive sins. All right, that's what we see there. And verse number eight, and when the multitudes, this is why the, the scribes, the Pharisees, that's why they're quiet, that's why they talk within themselves, because when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Now, I can't help but think that they're glorifying God because they're glorifying Jesus. It's not very spelt out there, but we can see who Jesus claims to be by, what his, by his actions. And then it says the multitudes glorify God. 
wouldn't surprise me if they glorify in Jesus Christ as well, because they've seen that Jesus Christ has the power of God in him. Verse number nine. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew. So this is the apostle Matthew to be sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. So the apostle Matthew, he was a tax collector. He was at the receipt of custom. The Bible also calls him a publican. Okay, and in this time, you know, the publicans were not well, you know, like government workers. I mean, I'm sure there's corruption in government even today. But by and large, there's a lot of, you know, in Australia anyway, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, rules. There's a lot of um, things that people need to follow, lots of processes. So, you know, the corruption in Australia is probably not even that great. But I'm sure it's out there. Okay, but these people at this time were known for their corrupt ways. That's why they were hated by many of the Jews, the publicans, you know. And even, even the Pharisees are calling out the publicans as wicked people, you know, because they were known to be cheaters. They were known to cheat their uh, fellow man. So he calls Matthew. Matthew comes and follows him. And then we go to verse number 10. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Now, it's not spelt out in this gospel, but in the gospel of Luke, it clearly says that this house is the house of Matthew. Okay, so Matthew, the one that's following after him, that leaves his job to follow after Christ, he invites his fellow publicans, he invites his fellow workers, his colleagues to come to his house to hear of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a really great example for us, for the people that we come across, the people that we work with, when we get the opportunity that we should invite them so they can hear the words of Jesus Christ, so we will be able to preach them the gospel, you know, invite them to church or just invite them to come and hear the words of God. But we see Matthew straight away, as soon as he follows Christ, he gets his fellow publicans, invites Jesus to a house, come and preach to my work colleagues, come, come and preach to my friends. And it says there, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him, and his disciples and when the Pharisees saw it so they're seeing Jesus eating you know having a meal having a feast with all the publicans and sinners and the, when the Pharisees saw it they said unto his disciples why eat of your master with publicans and sinners hey why is your master why is Jesus this so-called son of God you know this so-called one that does miracles why is he hanging around with the wicked why is he hanging around with the sinners what, do you, what are they saying about themselves you know, hey, you know, we're without sin. Hey, we're righteous. Okay. And look at this. But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Now, obviously, that's very true. You wouldn't necessarily go to the doctor unless there was a problem with you. You know, and, and if you're a stubborn man like me, men, we have a problem. You know, we get sick. And our wives are like, you better go to the doctor. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'll see it out. I'll see it out. You know, week after week, you know, for me, even several months, I can be coughing, you know, and it's like, just go to the doctor. And after a few months, I'm like, yeah, I think I might go to the doctor. You know, I mean, even our brother Luke, when did you have your injury on your knee? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. I mean, even, even brother Luke, you know, knowing that he had a problem with his knee, took 20 years to go and get it checked out by the, by the doctor. You know, men, we've got a problem with that, right? We've got a problem with that. But, but it's normal if we're sick that we would need to go to a physician. But those that are sick, all right? So what is he saying? He's saying that these publicans, these sinners that are eating with Jesus Christ, hey, they're admitting that they're sick, right? They're admitting that they need a physician, and of course, by physician, he's referring to himself, Jesus Christ, the physician, the healer. These people are coming to Jesus because they're recognizing themselves as sinners. They're seeing themselves as sick, needing a physician. Say, so what about the Pharisees? Don't they need a physician? But look at this, verse 13. Uh, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. So Jesus says, look, go and, 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 and learn. Like he, he's rebuking these guys. These guys are meant to be religious leaders. He says, go and learn what that meaneth. And then he says, what does he need to learn? I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. All right. Now you say, why is Jesus saying to them, go and learn this? Because this is a reference found in Hosea chapter 6, verse 4. Okay. Hosea, if you want to turn there, you can just to check it out. Hosea chapter 6, verse 4. Hosea chapter 6, verse 4. I think if we go back to the Old Testament, it's going to clarify for us what is Jesus referring to. Why is he saying these words to the uh, Pharisees? Hosea chapter 6, verse 4. The Bible reads, O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as the morning cloud, as a morning cloud, and as the early dew it goeth away. You know, God is saying to, to Israel here, 
He's saying, look, you're, you've got some goodness, but your goodness is like this morning cloud. It's like the dew. You know, that, that morning, uh, hum, the, the morning, what's the word I'm looking for? Humidity, you know, that, 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 that's there in the morning. You know, it's cool. Um, it's, uh, you know, but then by the, by the time the sun's up, by the time we get into day proper, that's all dissipated. It's all gone. All right? And he's saying to Israel, look, even your goodness, yeah, it's there, but it's, it's gone. For the, for the large part of the day, it's not even there. And then he says in uh, verse number, uh, what was I reading from? <laughs> verse, sorry? Yeah, Hosea chapter 6, verse 5. Therefore, so because your goodness goes away, all right, the early dew, it goes away. Therefore, have I hewed them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and thy judgments are as the light that goeth forth. Then he says this, For I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. All right. So he's saying to Israel, look, you're coming and you're doing the burnt offerings. You're going about, you know, uh, you know, week to week, going to church, as it were, obviously to the temple. You know, you're doing the sacrifices, but you're, you don't have the goodness in you. You haven't got the mercy in you. You're not doing it to serve me. You're just going about it and, and doing the practice, but it means nothing to you. All right. So God is calling them out. You say, what does that have to do with the Pharisees? Of course, you know, the Pharisees. On the outside, we're doing all the things. You know, they were tithing. They were the religious leaders. They were teaching things of the law. You know, even Jesus recognized some of the things that they teach were correct, were accurate. But they weren't. They were, their hearts were far from God. You know, and sometimes we, you know, can come to church every week. You know, sometimes we can put on the show. We can even go soul winning on a regular basis. You know, but we're not doing it for the Lord. We, you know, we're just going about the motions and doing it. Look, it, it, it's not such a bad thing, you know, to get into a habit and go, look, I'm going to go soul winning because I know I have to go soul winning. Or I'm going to go to church because I need to go to church. That's awesome. But more important than the sacrifice is the mercy. Mer- mercy comes first before sacrifice. And God wants to show us mercy. God wants to show us mercy first. How does He show us mercy? By us coming humbly before Him. When, you know, God shows us mercy when we come humbly calling on his on his name for salvation but not just that you know when we're far from god when we're in sin we need to come before god and seek his mercy and ask for his continual uh, forgiveness so we can be walking in fellowship with the lord god hey that comes first before your sacrifice before your service all right and you know i encourage you before you come to church before you go soul winning before you do anything uh, any kind of sacrifice for the lord make sure you go before god first and seek his mercy Okay, ask for forgiveness, go in humility before the, for the Lord God. That's what he wants first. And we say, let's tie that back into the story. Go back to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. So what is Jesus then pointing out to these Pharisees? You've got all the sacrifices, but you haven't got the mercy of God. Okay, your, your heart is far from him. Okay, and he goes, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. What he's saying to them is that you're also sick. All right, yes, you know, and then that's why it says, but, uh, um, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Hey, listen, the righteous person, the person that believes in their own righteousness, if they think their own righteousness is going to get them to heaven, they're not going to be called to repentance. Because they have to be humble. They have to realize that they're a sinner. They have to come before God and realize they're, they're a sick person needing the physician in order for them to obtain the mercy of God. So what Jesus Christ is then is, is saying to these Pharisees is, you're also sick. You also need a physician. Okay? But you don't see that in yourselves. That's why it says, look, go away and learn it. Go, go read the scriptures and learn it. And that's about you. That's about you, you know, in the other. So I hope that's given you sort of a clarification as to what's going on there. All right? Let's keep reading. Verse number 14. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, that's often, and thy disciples fast not? So we can see the Pharisees, the disciples of the Pharisees, the disciples of John, or, or the Pharisees and the disciples of John, they, they used to fast, you know? Um, and they're saying, Why don't your disciples fast? Because wh- what are they doing? They're at the feast, they're at Matthew's house. They're eating it up. They're, they're, you know, they're having a good time. You know, the fellowshipping, the preaching, the word of God. You know, these publicans are getting saved. It's been awesome. They're eating. You know, and says, why, you know, why are you eating so much? Like we fast. Why don't you guys fast? Verse number fifteen. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? 
But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So the bridegroom is the groom. You know, we just, we just dropped the word bride there, but I'm just calling the man the groom. He says, look, you know, and when are you called the groom? You're called the groom on the day of your wedding, aren't you? Or shortly after the wedding. Okay, so think about a wedding. When you're, when you're at a wedding, is that a time to fast? You know, is that a time to mourn? No, when you're at a wedding, that's a time to rejoice. That's, when you're at a wedding, it's a time to celebrate. You know, that, that union between husband and wife. That's why usually straight after the ceremony, there's a reception with food. You know, and so, you know, yeah, that's a time to eat. It's a time to rejoice. And he's saying, look, my, my disciples here, uh, they have the bridegroom, bridegroom. They have Jesus Christ. It's a time to rejoice. But he says there's coming a time, but the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them. What do you think that's a reference to? His crucifixion. When he'd be arrested, he'd be taken away from them. He'd be uh, crucified, die, raised again from the dead. And then it says, and then shall they fast. And look, fasting ought to be something that we do in our Christian lives. Because so notice what Jesus, Jesus doesn't say, look, Jesus says, and then shall they fast. So we are people that should be fasting. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us how often we should do it, but it is something that we should try to apply in our Christian lives. I, don't, I won't go into fasting too much right now, but I want you to understand what's going on, okay? There's a coming a time when the bridegroom will be taken away. We know that's his crucifixion, all right? Now, I'm just going to read to you very quickly from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Just very quickly, listen to this. And for this cause, talk, talking of Jesus, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So what Jesus is saying, look, I'm here, it's time to eat, it's time to rejoice, but there's a coming a time when I'm going to be taken away. Hey, that's going to be the death of the testator and bring in, and we'll see this later on, bring in that New Testament. And we live now in the New Testament times. Now it's time for us to fast and mourn. Okay. So why, say, why is that important? Because we're going to keep reading. You know, don't detach. You know, we get into a habit as Christians to study the Bible. We take a verse here, we take a verse there. It's all right, you know, we should do that. But we should also should always, you know, always keep in mind, let's try to keep these verses within the context of the chapter or the books that we're reading, okay? So why is that important? Because look, verse number 16, Jesus explains these things. He says, No man putteth a piece of new cloth onto an old garment. Now, as we read through these, these analogies that Jesus gives, I want you to think about the new cloth or anything to do with new about the New Testament. And anytime he talks about the Old, that's the Old Testament. Okay? Remember, uh, John the Baptist represented the Old Testament. He was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And you know, he brought, you know, Jesus Christ obviously being the first that brought in that, that New Testament at his death. So it says, No man, verse 16, no man put a piece of new cloth unto an old garment. For that which is put in to fill it up, take it from the garment, and the rent is made worse. So, you know, let's pretend this shirt right now, I've been wearing this, I don't, know, I don't know how long I've had this shirt, maybe a few months. Let's say it starts to wear and tear, I've been wearing it, it's been washed, it's been stretched, maybe it's even shrunk a little bit in the wash or whatever. And then I've been wearing it, but then I get a tear. All right, there's a bit of a tear. And my wife comes up and says, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that up. And she gets a, a piece of another garment, a new garment, and she sews it onto that, you know, that, that tear that's there. Okay, so what Jesus is saying is, that new piece will be stronger. Than, than the other piece because it hasn't had you know it hasn't stretched you know it hasn't been worn out okay so what's going to happen let's say we take that garment we put it into the wash once again let's say it shrinks it, like it's, it's a stronger material because it hasn't been worn like i said let's say it shrinks or whatever it changes uh what's the word i'm looking for it changes anyway it changes whatever because it shrinks or whatever then it's going to pull or rent that old garment it's going to make that tear worse all right. So what Jesus is saying, we, we can't fast now well, because it's time to rejoice. We're, we're, you know, he's operating under the Old Testament at this point in time, but he's going to bring in that New Testament. Okay? He's going to bring in that New Testament. And what I believe he's saying to the disciples of John the Baptist and to the Pharisees, hey, you're operating under the Old Testament right now, but there's going to come a time when, when the, when the bride, uh, bride, um, bridegroom is taken away when you need to receive Christ under that New Testament. Okay, that, under that New Testament uh, teaching. Let's keep reading because it, it keeps going. Verse number 17. Neither do men put new wine. And by the way, let me just stop there. 
new wine in the Bible is always a reference to freshly squeezed grape juice. That's why it's called new wine. It's just been, it's just been squashed. It's just been pressed. It's new. Okay? Uh, it's it's um, non-alcoholic uh, grape juice. Neither do, new, uh, neither do men put new wine into old bottles. Else the bottles break and the wine runneth out and the bottles perish, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Say, so what's that about? Is that, well, you know, if you just took grapes, okay, and on the skin of the grapes, there's yeast, you know, there's a film of yeast naturally on it. If you were to just crush grapes right now, take grapes and make grape juice, that yeast that's on the skin of the, of the, of, of the grapes will start to ferment the sugars in, in the grape juice and, and it'll start, you know, it starts to ferment, it starts to bubble up, you know, it, 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 and you say, well, is Jesus then talking about alcohol here? I don't believe, I don't believe so because even, even uh, regular um, fruit juice, if you took regular fruit juice, you know, let's say, I don't know if you guys have fruit juice, you know, it usually says on the bottle, drink within three to five days or something like that. Okay. And the reason for that is because once you've opened it, okay, there are, there are microorganisms in the air. You know, there are, there are little bacteria things. All, I mean, it's all over your body. It's all over the air. There's all microorganisms that operate. There's a secret world of all these microorganisms. So when you open that and you, you, you are exposed to oxygen, you know, some of those microorganisms will, will go into the drink. And in the same way as the yeast, it will start eating away at the sugars and it will start to ferment. All right. Have you ever like had a, a, a bottle of juice where, you know, you've had it out for too long or maybe it's been in the fridge long and you've drunk it and it's been like really bubbly, a bit fizzy? I don't know if you've experienced that. It's been there longer, or, or maybe it's been out in the heat. So then it's 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 uh, it's it's gone sort of quicker. Well, that's that's the expansion. That's the fermentation that takes place. And usually you'll find your bottles they've expanded a little bit. They expanded because it's, it's been bubbly. All right. Or, or think about milk. Even milk. You know, if, if you've left, you know, if you've, you drink milk and you left the milk bottle out and you just have the residue of the milk and you have it closed after a while, after a few days, the milk bottle starts to expand because a little bit of what's in there has has started to ferment. All right. So. What are, my point is this, those, the bottles, what I've read about, from what I understand, the bottles that were used in this time were uh, uh, bottles made of leather or, or skins, all right? So when you think about that, if you have uh, new wine, you've, you've got freshly squeezed grape juice and you've had it in that bottle and you've been opening it, you're drinking it, it there's been time for it to ferment, okay? And like if you're saying, was that alcohol? Well, normally, when I look this up, alcohol normally takes a week or two weeks before, it, uh, before the yeast completely eats up the sugars. All right, before it becomes alcoholic. Now, I don't want to go too much into all of that. I have also seen that, um, you know, obviously there's pasteurization. If you don't know what pasteurization is, it helps um, keep things to last longer. Like, for example, you know, you've got long life milk, you know, and the, the reason why it's called long life milk is because when it's been harvested from the cow, it's been heated up. Okay, and when you heat it up, you kill the bacteria, you kill all the microorganisms that's within that drink. And then they airtight, they, they seal it airtight, and that's why it lasts longer, because all those microorganisms have been killed off. That's why it's called long life milk. It's been, it's been heated up. It's gone through a different process than your regular milk, okay? The same thing can be done with juice. You know, a lot of grape juice is heated up once it's been uh, uh, squeezed, uh, it's been boiled or warmed up, it's killed the, the yeast, it's killed the bacteria, and then they airtight, they seal it airtight, and that Grape juice will, will never ferment, will never become alcohol, unless you open it, and then you, uh, unless you obviously open it and throw yeast into it or something like that, okay? My point is, you know, any kind of juices, any kind of liquid like that will start to ferment, will start to bubble up once it's been opened for a while. So when you put the new wine in there and you're using old bottles, those, those old bottles have already expanded. They've expanded. They've become weaker. And then if you take new wine once again and add it to those old bottles, Again, it's going to go through a bit of fermentation. It's going to become weaker. At some point, those, those, uh, those bottles will burst. At some point, those bottles will burst. So what he's saying here is when you've got the new wine, in verse number 17, uh, but they put new wine into new bottles and both are preserved. Okay, because if you put new wine in an old bottle, it's likely that it's going to burst. You, you lose that bottle and you, you'll lose the liquid that was, that was contained in it. Okay, so what is he saying? He says, look, there's going to come a time where the New Testament comes in, when the bridegroom is taken away, okay? And at that point, you need to take the new wine and put it into the new bottles, okay? You need to go from the Old Testament and receive the testator of the New Testament, okay? Now, uh, 
I'll just, I'll just end with one more verse here. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13, which says, In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth, waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay, so we see the New Testament has come in. The New Testament is referred to as being new, and the and the new and the and the, uh, the first covenant is referred to as old. And so, what I believe Jesus Christ is teaching in these in, in, uh, about the about the fasting, about the new wine, about the new garments, is that the New Testament is coming, and you better receive the testator of the New Testament. You know, uh, so. That's what I've got for you so far, guys. I hope I went about half an hour. Maybe I went longer. I'm not sure. But let's pray.